had been doing weekly, then we went to bi-weekly, and now we are switching it to, uh, to once a month. We have a fascinating topic today, one that's very, very topical. Um, honestly, it's not something I've seen a great deal about anywhere within our industry. Artificial intelligence in the cockpit. Now, I'm certain there's already been more than one of you who has made a, a joke about a co-pilot or something like that. Um, but this is something that really has, uh, has me intrigued. Autonomous flight has probably been getting the most of the attention. But um, the use of artificial intelligence to support flight operations, in, from what I've been able to determine, has not received as much notice yet. Um, obviously, there are plenty of instances where uh, there are two pilot operations uh, where they're required. And perhaps even our pilot shortage could uh, soon be addressed by using a single pilot who is capably supported by AI technology. We have a very renowned presenter today. Uh, Dr. Luke Van Dyke is the CEO and founder of Daedalen, a Switzerland-based company developing flight control software for autonomous flight with the eventual goal of creating an AI pilot that will measurably outperform human pilots in all of their functions. Currently, Daedalen is working with regulators, leading aerospace manufacturers, and major EV tall companies to test and certify the first machine learning based sensor systems for guidance, navigation, and flight control. Uh, Dr. D uh, Van Dyke holds a PhD in physics and previously held senior software engineering positions at Google Zurich and SpaceX, where he worked on infrastructure, flight software, and machine learning projects, among others. If you are new to our webinars, we'd like to make these uh, interactive. We do encourage you to ask questions, especially on a topic as new and fresh as this is. Uh, we know that there's a chat module in Zoom. Uh, feel free to chat amongst yourselves. But uh, if you want to get a question um, for the end of the presentation, please use the question and answer module. We will not be able to answer questions during the webinar. We will uh, hold them all till the very end. Um, our webinar is being recorded, and we will make this recording available as soon as possible. Usually, it takes about 24 hours for us to get us posted to uh, both our website and to our YouTube channel. Um, we'll get that up as soon as we can. Feel free to share it amongst yourselves. Feel free to watch it um, uh, you know, at your convenience if you need to uh, learn something or go back and pick something else up again. So now please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Luke Van Dyke to our webinar series. Yes, this is where I unmute. <laughs> But not yet still my screen. Yeah, we got you. We got you clear here. Hey, question before we get started. We we just announced this week that the recipients for our uh, Salute to Excellence uh, Land and Live Award, and it was uh, recognizing the work of two pilots to address an in-flight emergency that could have had just catastrophic results. Their collaborative efforts and decision making ended up preventing a tragedy. Um, they were able to get the aircraft on the ground, and everyone lived. How might artificial intelligence eventually provide assistance to a single pilot in a similar situation? Well, I'm I'm glad you formulate the question uh, in this very realistic way because often an introduction like this is followed by "I don't see your system, you know, save the day in these extreme circumstances." And, and you'd be right, you know, these these were heroic pilots, you know, creatively dealing with extraordinary conditions and, and saving the day. Fortunately, the safety of the air does not depend on this happening on a daily basis. Um, and the way you frame the question, can AI, you know, maybe help do this with a single pilot or in what way is much more realistic. And I think having realistic expectations and making the machine do realistic things is key to rolling this out and actually uh, adding safety to, to the air rather than doing risky things to save money here or what is something there. So one of the key things in the example that you named uh, it was exemplary teamwork by two pilots who developed who divided the labor under extreme stress uh, um, uh, and managed to take a very unsafe situation and keep it under control and 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 hold it back and so unless the engineers thought of a scenario like this up front i i cannot promise that the first version of our product you know will could replace either of these uh of, of these pilots but 
who knows eventually. What we can do is we can, uh, in current single pilot operations, so imagine this had been a single pilot operation, right? And then the single guy had to deal with all the stress of trying to manage uh, the power and deciding where to go and finding a landing clearance. Um, uh, what if the currently legal and valid and existing single pilot operations are supported by uh, a machine co-pilot that has their back and, you know, in the circumstance like this could, for example, pick the landing site and it could take over control of the cyclic while the pilot was trying to deal with, you know, the power management and trying to keep the thing from, you know, going up or going down too fast or too slow. Um, uh, 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 an electric uh, co-pilot to to simplify its hey, name. Doc, Dr. Yeah. Van Dyke, Luke, Luke, um, yeah. we're going to have to back up. I just realized this didn't start for some reason. Um, Aha, a, I'm in the practice session. So please go ahead and turn your camera back off and we'll get this started. <laughs> okay. I apologize. Uh, I was trying to look to see how many people we had, and there was nobody there, so I apologize. I for... just noticed it was three from here talking to Greg, because Greg, he didn't get on yet. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Dan Sweet, and I'm with Helicopter Association International. Welcome to our new monthly webinar series, and we have an exciting topic today. If you've been waiting in the waiting room for a, a short period, I do apologize. Apparently, Zoom changed their controls on me recently, and uh, the buttons I used to push no longer work. So it uh, looks like we've got a whole bunch of you, of you joining in right now. I'm grateful that you uh, were patient with us. Um, as I mentioned, today's topic to me is fascinating. It's really an exciting uh, possibility for us. Um, artificial intelligence in the cockpit. Now, if you're like me, you probably have already made a joke about uh, uh, co-pilots. I'm not a pilot, uh, so I, I tread lightly very there. Uh, artificial intelligence or artif autonomous flight, rather, is getting a great deal of attention in our industry right now. And um, we know eventually, and this is going to be a long ways down the road, uh, autonomous flight uh, will carry passengers, will be doing much of the work that uh, pilots do now. That's, uh, again, quite a ways down the road. Artificial intelligence hasn't seemed to me to receive as much consideration yet. And there are already many instances where two pilots are required uh, for certain flight operations. And that's one area where I think that uh, this could help. And then we all we know there's a pilot shortage too. And so by allowing artificial intelligence to support a, a pilot or eventually replace a pilot is a, may, a way or a method to help address that situation. Um, today, our panelist, we have uh, somebody who absolutely knows what they're talking about. We're very grateful to have Dr. Luke Van Dyke. He is the CDO, CEO and founder of Daedalin, a Switzerland-based company developing flight control software for autonomous flight with the eventual goal of uh, creating an AI pilot that will measurably outperform human pilots in all their functions. Currently, Daedalin is working with regulators, leading aerospace manufacturers, major eVTOL companies to test and certify the first machine learning-based sy sensor systems for guidance, navigation, and flight control. He holds a PhD in physics and previously held senior software engineering positions at Google Zurich and SpaceX, where he worked on infrastructure, flight software, and machine learning projects, among others. If this is your first time with one of our webinars, we welcome you. Um, we do encourage you to ask questions. This is pretty new uh, information, so I expect there'll be quite a few questions out there. Please use the question and answer module within the uh, Zoom system. I'm not sure you could be on the side or on the bottom somewhere in your uh, phone or however you're using to watch this. Um, we know that there's a chat feature. Go ahead and chat amongst yourselves if you like, but uh, we're going to pay more attention to the QA feature and we'll get to all the questions following Dr. Van Dyke's presentation. This webinar is being recorded. We do encourage you to uh, go back, watch what you might have missed, uh, share the video with anybody else you think might be interested. It usually takes us about 24 hours to get these posted. Um, we'll get them posted to both our web, uh, excuse me, our HAI website and our YouTube channel as quickly as possible. So let me stop sharing and we will invite uh, Dr. Van Dyke to uh, join us. Luke, please bring your camera up. Oops, uh, okay, I guess it works now. There we go. Thank you for having me. 
<laughs> yes, I appreciate it loud and clear, and uh, your camera looks great. Hey, uh, I, I've got a question actually to kind of just get us started. Um, we just announced the recipients of our annual Salute to Excellence Land and Live Award winners this week. Um, and we recognize the work of two pilots uh, who collaborated to address an in-flight emergency that could have had catastrophic results. Their efforts and decision-making ended up helping to prevent the tragedy. They got the aircraft on the ground. Everybody was fine. How might artificial intelligence eventually provide assistance to a single pilot in a similar situation? Uh, yeah, I, I saw that uh, the story of these uh, uh, fine gentlemen, and I'm I'm very glad you formulate the question in this way. How could AI help to do something? Rather, because often after an introduction like this, people say, "And and now, how's going to how's your system going to save the day in these you know uh, dire circumstances?" And that leads often to an unfair comparison because it's not that the general safety of general aviation today in the sky. Uh, depends on people doing this type of heroic feat on a daily basis, but if you if you you know frame it in a realistic way, then and I think it's very important to set realistic expectations on on these AI systems, uh, then we could definitely uh, see how we could take. Uh, imagine this in this event we had had a single pilot who had to deal with this extreme emergency of the power uh, management going uh, going off the off the scale. Um, it was the, the division of labor between the two pilots that uh, contributed significantly, I think, to, to the outcome. So you have, imagine this had been a single pilot. We could give such a single pilot doing perfectly legal and safe normal operations, finding himself in, or herself in such an extreme case, uh, an, an electric co-pilot that, for example, could do take over the guidance to the ground to find the safe spot while the human... Uh, pilot focuses on the power management. That that could have been a realistic scenario in this case. And I think it's well within reach to build systems that could, that could have such a backup plan ready um, to uh, give the uh, single pilot, uh, again, currently you know, perfectly legal in certain circumstances to have commercial single pilot operations. What if you give these people an extra pair of eyes that has their back and we can start creating an aircraft that uh, you know, doesn't kill you if you let go of the controls or it gives you time to worry about the extreme circumstances while the computer takes over um, you know, basic things like uh, seeing where you are and where you want to go. Um, so uh, this actually leads very much into the theme of my talk, which is we think that the path to full autonomy goes through um, creating, first giving existing single pilot operations a co-pilot and then adding safety along the way at every step rather than coming up with an unrealistic uh, scenario where, you know, just as this computer is going to fly and we won't need any pilots, uh, which we think is a, it's not a good way to do this. So yeah, you've, you've, you've touched on the, on the theme of my talk. Uh, actually we've, we've done it now. We can, we can stop here. <laughs> okay. Well, <All> right. <laughs> I'll tell you what, let me turn my camera off. I'll keep yeah. my microphone on for just a minute and make sure that your presentation comes up and I'll let okay. you uh, lead in. Okay, let me see if this thing worked as we rehearsed. You should be seeing something called AI in the cockpit. Yes, I do um, see your screen. Yes, yes. And uh, we have 64 participants, I guess. It shows on my screen. So uh, thank you for taking the patience to listen to me tonight. And thank you, uh, Dan, Jasmine, for, for having me here tonight. Um, um, so we are Dalian. Um, uh, everybody gets to pronounce it the way they want. I knew this when I chose the company name that there was going to be differences of opinion. Everybody's opinion is equally valid. I say the daily in. Uh, we are uh, six, no, seven and a half years old. We are by now about 150 staff. We try to bridge the world between the academic world world of machine learning, robotics, uh, computer vision, and the other side, the uh, uh, pilots and uh, aerospace industry personnel, uh, people with... Uh, uh, experience designing and manufacturing uh, aircraft, um, and our uh, population makeup reflects that. Um, so we started in 2016 with the idea, actually it was a very naive idea, uh, that uh, if you took the seat skill test, it was a formal description of what it is you're supposed to do as a pilot during your exam, right? Which is supposed to be the bar. If you make that, you're allowed to fly. Uh, you know, I know there's not a lot of other 
conditions you have to fulfill, but it's a blueprint of what the human pilot actually does. So we thought if we make systems that do all these things that are enumerated here, uh, and we me measurably outperform the human pilot in every way, we should be good. You know, we should be done. And we thought we'd be done by now because <laughs> we were naive. And um, so we we deconstructed this pilot and uh, looked at what it is that he or she d does. So it, it begs the question, what, what does the pilot actually do? And so a lot of discussions about autonomy and 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 self self flying and also self driving. You know, people point out, oh, you know, the my my airliner already flies itself. The pilot just sit there and monitor things. And uh, this helicopter, you know, has an autopilot and a GPS. So what do I need the human for? So this misconception easily made by the lay people, but you know, pilots know better. You're not there to move the stick. You're not there to move the controls and push the buttons. You are there to maintain a safe state. Um, you do that by looking at the environment, seeing where you are, seeing where the aircraft is, seeing what state the aircraft is in, seeing what state elements of the environment are in, for which you need to understand what it is you're seeing. A cloud behaves different than another aircraft. A uh, runway is different than uh, a freeway. Uh, something taxiing on the runway behaves in certain ways. And so based on your semantic understanding of what you see or what you perceive, it goes beyond seeing, uh, you can predict the next 10 seconds, the next 100 seconds, and you can try to predict where things would become dangerous and where how to keep them safe. And based on that, you would change the flight plan, which might you know be at the level of you move controls a bit to move out of the way of, uh, to give the proper right of way, uh, or you change your flight plan. And so the proper way to think about this was laid out by Professor Nancy Levison of uh, MIT, uh, in terms of uh, hierarchy of control loops. So you usually, you, uh, 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 and the control loop is of course a fundamental ingredient in engineering and thinking about how to build systems that do something intelligent in the world. So um, this earlier uh, criticism that my aircraft is already automatic, it mistakes the level at which we're controlling the aircraft. Um, so you can perfectly easily automate and autopilots do this. and. The cruise is often boring because the computer takes care of the normal case. Uh, but the pilot is on top of that control loop monitoring if the lower level systems are doing a thing. So that means if we want to now build systems that take over the pilot's job to some extent, we can't just add another uh, box in that bottom layer. We can't just add another instrument in the cockpit that says, beep, there's something wrong. Bob, you have to uh, pay attention to me because something wrong, you have to make a new kind of instrument with, which fulfills new kinds of functions, namely it integrates all this data uh, that it can find uh, and helps the pilots uh, maintain this safe state. So that's been maintain a safe state here, I'll say it again. Um, so fortunately flying is a lot simpler than driving. So the, the promises of AI helping you drive have been, uh, you know, through their typical valley of uh, over uh, hyped expectations and the sorry peak of expectations and the and the trough of uh, disappointment, uh, flying in itself from a robotics perspective is an easier problem. Um, it can be summarized as don't fly into anything you can see unless you're 100 percent sure that you want to land on it. And you can make this a bit more precise. So if you take off, you know, you want to not fly into masts and wires. You want to avoid other people that fly there according to the rules of the air. You want to be able to uh, land, you know, on purpose or emergency landing uh, on a helipad or off a helipad. We have a similar graphic for a fixed wing, uh, by the way. You want to avoid the mountain. You want to avoid the weather. Uh, and you want to uh, execute your mission. The difference with self-driving and the AI applications there is that uh, the safety bar is much higher because it's much potentially much unsafer to sit at high altitude and high velocity. Uh, the stakes are higher and the safety bar is higher. So you're in a different corner of the design space. So our uh, vision here is to not you know, show up with, trust us, this box is 100% uh, better than people, uh, dear FA, let us fly it. Because even if it was actually true, you know, they have good reasons to not believe you. <laughs> and so what we want to do is we want to create an aircraft that is smart enough so that the crew um, can focus on these higher level tasks and can start interacting with the flight plan 
rather than directly with the aircraft, thereby freeing up a lot of mental capacity uh, and making it possible to safely conduct uh, single pilot uh, operations, which are already legal today with an extra layer of safety uh, that uh, is going to be hard to argue with. Um, so this way, instead of having a mountain of obstacles to your uh, autonomous flight applications, uh, we are going to fly around the mountain by you know, adding these safety fe features, uh, and, and which of course you know, brings upon the homework uh, to actually demonstrate that, um, and then uh, eventually come to a fully autonomous uh, aircraft in the future after we have demonstrated that the interactions of the pilot are uh, superfluous. So that's the that's the strategy we want to roll out. And if we don't meet that bar, I think we should not be allowed to put such systems in operation. Um, so we started uh, simple and, and easy. Um, most people uh, start to fly in DMC and VFR, learn to fly in DMC and VFR. Even if you fly IFR, you still are going to need a number of capabilities that are uh, absolutely required in VFR. Namely, you have to see where you are, and you have to see where others are flying, and you have to see where you land. And seeing where you are is important because you know that you can't trust your GPS because it can be switched off by evil people that buy a cheap device on uh, AliExpress. Uh, traffic detection is actually, you know, it's the law. Part 91.113 says that if conditions are visual, it doesn't matter if you fly IFR or VFR, each pilot shall remain vigilant and look out the window to give the proper right of way. And you all know if you're a pilot that you don't see everything out there and that this system works because the sky is big and empty um, because there's a lot of things that you haven't seen. And of course, ADSB is going to help uh, there a lot, but there's also uh, uncooperative traffic and that's not a valid reason to fly into them. Um, then landing guidance. Uh, is you know people land aircraft, uh, fixed wing and rotorcraft with no machine assistance routinely, um, and for that you need to find the place where you want to land uh, and uh, decide if it's clear or not. And and we do this routinely without any ground infrastructure whatsoever. There's only you know concrete or sometimes even a grass runway. So we decided to build systems that can do these three basic things first. Um, we call the system the VXS. It can use uh, it uses a downward fisheye camera to recognize uh, the landscape and your motion through the landscape, and it provides a completely independent reading of position that you can compare to your GPS. And it's engineered in such a way that if they disagree, you should trust your eyes. So uh, as long as we see something with texture, we can provide you guidance towards the ground. For example, for an emergency outer rotation on a helicopter. And we can see if uh, the, the, the space is actually clear. Um, hmm. Then uh, visual traffic detection is our uh, uh, flagship product, which is the first one we are trying to get certified with the FAA. So we're in an STC project um, uh, dealing with this. Uh, it's a system that uses a high resolution camera in the visual spectrum. Because um, you know, if hu humans can do it in principle, there's a lot of information in the visual spectrum. And our system uh, looks at all the pixels all the time and finds uh, things that uh, are very likely, you know, likely enough to be aircraft that you should be alerted to it. And in the first version, we can uh, show this on the screen along with the ADSB traffic information and give you clues in which direction to look uh, and what type of aircraft you might be dealing with. And we can also see flocks of birds um, and uh, uh, other you know, things in the air that are not cooperative. And the visual landing guidance, uh, I actually, I already introduced it. It's a camera-based system that can find a runway, can find your position relative to the runway, can do the geometry, and can give you guidance to a fixed wing landing. And there's an equivalent system for, for vertical landing. So why do we call these systems AI, you might ask? And when we started, AI was very much into computer vision and you know recognizing that there's a cat in the video you know recognizing faces in in your google photos the last i would say year and a half everybody's talking about chat gtp which is an amazing piece of te technology that i at this point have no idea how to safely apply in a cockpit so when we say ai actually ai has been a marketing term since the 1950s in 19 in the 1950s ai was a computer playing chess 
And, you know, and that turned out to be actually easy. And when things become easy and we know how to do that, we no longer call them AI, we call them computer science. So uh, 15, 20 years ago, it was almost impossible for a computer program to decide if a picture had a bird in it or a cat or um, slowly this became possible. And nowadays, you know, it, you you almost wouldn't call the AI anymore. So we call it machine learning. Uh, it's a class of systems that are engineered by having one computer program fiddle the knobs on a family of computer programs until it finds a particular uh, computer program or a particular setting of these knobs that satisfies the quality constraints. And this is a different way than traditional writing of software. Uh, we use a thing called neural networks, which are also used in this chat GTP thing, but I might have some comments on that. But so so we're not even doing the chat GTP thing. We're not asking, you know, oh, computer, tell me which way I should fly. We are having a little component that acts like a filter, a, a noisy filter on, an, on a noisy problem. Here's an image. Is there an aircraft in there? Or here's an image. Where's the runway? And because we use this neural network, we had to um, uh, invent some new things. So here, this slide is about why why machine learning. And so what I tried to say earlier was, so the problem of drawing a box around this helicopter has been possible with computers only for the last, I would say, 10, 15 years. And to do it relatively reliably um, you know, is more recent. And then, but once you have this capability, you can do amazing things because humans need to, human eye is a, is a miracle uh, in, in many ways, but uh, you have to point it in a certain direction, otherwise you don't see things. It's better at seeing things that move, uh, which can mislead you uh, because the things are on a collision trajectory where it don't actually appear to move. Um, so we have a system that can, you know, clearly outperform the human eye uh, in almost every way, I would say, uh, in this particular respect. Uh, and the only way to feasibly do this is with this technique called machine learning, which is often marketed as, as AI. And that means, because we are professionals and we're not a bunch of you know amateurs that cobble together some, some demo, uh, we want to certify this. We want to pass the FAA bar for proving fitness of purpose in absence of unintended function. And it depends on the kind of aircraft you fly, but it's, you know, part 23, 2500, and 1301, and 1309. Um, other things are like, you know, uh, uh, 1329. Um, but in this case, we have to prove that this machine learning-based component uh, delivers the intended function, no more, no unintended functions, and no less, and that it is safe. You know, the, the no unintended function goes into safety. The thing should not... Um, make things worse uh, under any foreseeable operating conditions. And so that brings us to how do you do this? So for what we call classical systems, which are you know, often contain computers with complex hardware and complex software, there are development processes. Uh, uh, first, you have to follow the safety analysis and the system design processes the design, uh, defined in the ARPs, and then you have uh, functions allocated to software, allocated to hardware, and the standards like GEAR254 and GEAR178 um, prescribe the amount of work you have to do um, in order for the FAA to believe that it's a valid thing, that, it's, that it, it works as intended. And the interesting thing is, because software is actually very hard to prove to be correct, the only way that we can do this is by relying on the experience that if we do this amount of extra diligence, that's the design assurance level, we have a system that we think we can trust uh, to some extent. And the interesting thing is that for a machine learned system, this extra pile of work that you have to do for classical software and classical hardware, it's not really possible. One of these things is called the traceability of requirements, meaning we're not just writing software, we're writing very detailed requirements and we're mapping the software to these requirements. So these neural networks, they Basically, their description is a million numbers. And what people in 2016, when we started, were very worried about is that you can't trace requirements from the value of these numbers to these requirements. So that means we have to come up with a new way of doing this. And when we started, that meant we realized that, first of all, everybody at the time believed 
neural networks, machine learning, AI was fundamentally uncertifiable. And AI in the sense of computer systems that we don't really know how to do yet, they are fundamentally uncertifiable because we don't actually know what they do yet. With machine learning, we actually know what they do. So we thought the reason people believe this is wrong. And so it should be possible to prove um, fitness for purpose in the absence of an, an, an undetected, uh, un, un intended function. Sorry, it's late here. Um, but that means that we not only have to build a thing, which you know is normal engineer. We do not only have to build the evidence that the thing works as advertised, which is normal in aerospace. In this case, we also have to develop the theory of how to even argue that for a machine learning component. So we spent a considerable part of our seven and a half years doing that. Uh, we did two projects with the uh, EASA um, uh, on concepts for design assurance for neural networks. Uh, and then we did uh, one further project with the FAA. Um, all of these three resulted in reports where we lay out uh, a framework and approach you know, methods uh, towards this. Uh, we're trying out this approach in our first STC project with the uh, uh, computer vision machine learning based uh, traffic detection. Um, and that's where we are today. So with that, oh, that's where we are today. That was this slide. So um, this first instrument is going to be certified as pilot assistant. So it's not that we take the cameras, feed them to a giant neural network that we train on whatever, and then directly connect it to the controls of the, of the aircraft. Uh, what we do is we put the machine learn function in the box where we really need it, where we have no alternative, and it fulfills you know, the requirements there, and we have a means to um, to uh, prove that. And then the function of the system as a whole, in this first instance, is help the pilot find the traffic. Uh, the, the next function is going to be help the pilot find the landing site. For the landing site finder in a helicopter, we can have an emergency landing plan ready before the uh, event happens so that when the outer rotation takes place, if you take your hands off the stick, the thing will auto rotate to the to the to you know a sane and this your least bad option, and so and I think we can outperform the judgment uh, of the typical human pilot uh, there. So we're in the middle of that uh, STC project. Uh, we hope to close uh, uh, the remaining SOIs in the course of this year, uh, which is an ambitious timeline, and then. Uh, have passed the hurdle for the first one and can quickly pass the other ones. Um, so with that, uh, the STC in question is with partner Avidine. We're bringing this instrument to market, three cameras uh, and a box that does the processing. It displays the traffic um, uh, uh, mixed in with the ADS-B uh, display and uh, it you know, integrates naturally with uh, the existing corporate uh, instruments. Uh, we have other things in more experimental stages where we actually interface with the uh, with the autopilot, four axis autopilot of the helicopter, and uh, can come towards the system that can reduce the workload of the pilot by being a second pilot. So with that, I hope I have met your expectations, and I would like to open the floor to questions. And I'm bringing my camera back up. There we go. Uh, that was fascinating. Um, I really appreciate uh, the presentation, uh, Luke. Um, we'll start out with a question um, from Eric. And he says, thank you for the presentation. Um, as new entrants come into the airspace, can you expand, one, on the training data set, and two, speak, how to, speak to how this impacts the certification of the system? Um, uh, I don't understand the first part. As new, ent as new entrants into the... Well, maybe let's just leave that out. Can you expand on the training data yeah. systems, this yes. training data so, set, and then again, how it right. impacts and, the... Uh... Uh, uh, right, that, that's actually a very good question. So if you come in with the expectation, all people talk about AI in the cockpit, you know, I have this I have this abstract entity that behaves just like a pilot. Pilots are trained. We need to train this, this thing to behave in all kinds of circumstances. We don't. What our machine learns, our AI component does is it's restricted to the, here's an image, draw a box around the aircraft. That's a hard enough problem. Once you have that, you can build all kinds of classical systems to do these things. But yes, to build this machine learn system, it needs to be trained. It, you know, and the training itself is a metaphor. 
um, you know, it's a valid word to call it. It's not like uh, a pilot that has to be, uh, uh, you know, making a certain number of hours. Although in, in a certain sense it is, we have to have lots of labeled examples of this is what this, you know, this little thing is an aircraft. This little thing is not an aircraft. And gathering the data is actually expensive. We have to have it annotated in some way. So we have uh, an office of human annotators that have to, uh, so we gather data from flying around in representative uh, environments. Uh, we get a lots of footage of, you know, things with aircraft and things that are not aircraft. Uh, we need to have this ground truth labeled by our data annotation team. And then it goes into the uh, neural network training and verification pipeline. And the uh, the essence of our verification strategy is to show that that training set is representative of reality. Because if it is representative of reality, then uh, and your machine learning algorithm and your neural network fulfill certain mathematical conditions, you have valid mathematical reason to believe it will work in the wild the same as you tested in the lab. And so this is the crux of our, our ver verification strategy. The, the um, managing the data and making sure that uh, the performance of your network, it's called generalizes to, to the real world. Um, and with this, we actually have a very strong fundament under this um, certification strategy. I, I hope I answered the question there. I, I'm, I'm guessing so. We, uh, we're getting a bunch of questions in now. Let's go with uh, one from Abraham. Would the system display low altitude obstacles and other air obstacles such as balloons uh, birds or UAVs? Yes. Uh, yes, we carefully constructed the system to also show you that there is something, even if it's not, not sure what it is. So the thing that says there's something there and the thing that guess, tries to guess what it is, they are relatively independent and because it would be very tragic if we didn't tell you not to fly into an air balloon that looks like a massive commercial uh, you know, for a bottle of uh, wine. Uh, so you have this massive bottle of wine flying through the sky because somebody thought it would be a great campaign. We fly into it because, you know, who expects a bottle of wine? Actually, in, in driving, I saw a similar example. There was a guy in a chicken costume, you know, running across the road. So, you know, anything that starts with this is what a human looks like and we're gonna, uh, is, is, is fundamentally badly designed. So we recognize uh, flocks of birds uh, and, and things that we don't recognize will still tell you, I think it's, you know, suspended in the air, don't fly into it. Um, the ground is actually a very interesting source of uh, false positives. So it turns out that a major trick of the trade here is to tune your, your recognizing function such that it doesn't throw away too many things too early on, but that you, you know, use some signals to throw things away later. Um, and, and there also, there be dragons. For example, it makes a great demo if you can see things that move, right? And as a human, you pick up things that move. If you design your system so that you use the apparent motion as a cue, as a signal to find things, you have made something that uh, is probably useless when you're on a collision trajectory. So in the dangerous case, when uh, when you're on a collision trajectory, things appear to stay in the same spot, they just slowly grow. So what we want is a system where everything that we see counts as evidence that we would have also seen it if it was on a collision trajectory. So that makes it, you know, it puts the bar harder, but it means that all the things we do see count as evidence that we would see them in dangerous cases. I think I'm now, you know, off on a tangent that wasn't really asked, but I can talk about this for a long time. <laughs> well, uh, let me ask about, this is just a personal question that came up for me, question uh, for items that aren't necessarily as visible as objects in flight. And what I'm thinking right. about are maybe like power line wires. Uh, ah. Uh, you know, that are, you Very know, good question. There, yes. but they're almost invisible sometimes. Right, 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 right. So it's it's a separate system, um, and uh, it's a separate use case, separate data. It's very interesting. Um, so as a human, you use lots of cues, and our system can do the two. So if you see this mast, or if you see this string of masts, even if you don't see the wires between them, you know there's a wire between them. If there's suddenly an orange ball suspended in the sky, you know you can infer that this slight discoloration that you wouldn't have paid attention to, probably a wire. And so uh, we can give the system this context and, and have it picked up. And there's another interesting thing, which actually, uh, if you think about it, you would already know. You can see things that are smaller than the pixel of a camera. So you, you think, oh, if it's smaller than a pixel, you can't see it. No, the probability that it reflects a photon is still there if it's way smaller than a camera. 
anymore. So you can actually see these wires, but they take the form of these subtle discolorations that, that hang in the distance. And we can totally outperform the human there. We can find cables that you, you had not uh, uh, thought about. And for helicopter operations, it's particularly uh, useful because we know many examples where, you know, I wouldn't say the dominance, but, you know, a leading cause of the incident is flying into a cable that you actually totally forgot about was there. And um, uh, so that's, uh, we can, we can we can give you an extra pair of eyes that that has your back, but also your front, and uh, so in this way, uh, and then but then you can make a very primitive instrument that then shows this, shows this to the pilot. But then to communicate to the pilot, you know, you'd have an extra screen. Your eyes would be there instead of outside where they would be. So we think that this kind of knowledge is better brought into a system that says you know keeps the whole thing in view, and it's only if it knows that the pilot is currently on a trajectory where he has a chance of hitting it, says, meh, I wouldn't do that. Or, you know, gently pushes back on the stick with uh, an audio signal. Or actually says, hey, Bob, you know, don't go there. There's a wire you, that you haven't seen. Um, so, uh, and that whole field of HMI is, is uh, we're scratching the surface of that and we're exploring that. And we think it's very important to just not just add to the noise, but actually, you know, add to the safety. Okay, well, let's jump to a question from Marana, I guess. Um, I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Could your system, for example, monitor if the aircraft is getting icing or also monitor health parameters of the uh, aircraft's internal systems? Right. So the current central suite we're, we're looking at is cameras that look outside. And so we figured that you know, detecting that you have icing is a solved problem and, you know, making a reliable sensor for that does not really require AI. It just means, you know, it, it requires a budget and a good sensor. Having all these sensors integrated or, you know, in, if you don't have, a, inferring that your icing sensor might not be working because of this other combination of things that happen to be going on and going, hey, I think this icing sensor is off, you know, or uh, finding, so you have different sensor modes patching together all degrees of freedom in your environment. And then suddenly this hole appears, you know, having the system figure out, you know, this sensor is dead. Uh, or I, I think I, I no longer hear my tail rotor. I wonder what's going on. These things are definitely within reach of, uh, of technology today. And then the, the challenge is to prove that you're adding safety and not adding more complexity for which you need uh, higher qualified crew to deal with the inevitable more complex failure modes. So um, it's, and it's a very intellectually, so this is what the joy I get out of this. It's intellectually very satisfying to think of ways that you make systems that are you know clearly better in every way and don't introduce these traps that you've actually made something that, uh, so I, I find this thinking about safety very inspiring. Um. Let's continue on with another technical question. Um, can you combine optical camera data with infrared uh, data as yes. visibility degrades? Yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. For me to add yeah. a question onto that, could you also <laughs> include mapping data sets from, say, Google yes. or whether so? Absolutely. So, so the goal is to add to integrate all the information that we have in such a way that if there's something wrong. You know, it's not up to the pilot to decide it's wrong. Um, so our visual algorithms uh, for positioning work out of the box in the infrared, and it's a simple way to outperform the human by cheating. You know, you add a wavelength that isn't there, and then you can fly into if you, if it's a long wave infrared camera, you can uh, go pretty far into uh, IMC conditions. Not all the way. At some point, you know, if you don't see, you don't see, um, and that's dangerous. But uh, um, it is an advantage that uh, how, how do I put this? You can you know you can cobble more variations together with these systems than you can experiment with the you know composition of the human body and mind. And so this is one of the reasons why I think you know if you take slow realistic steps, eventually you are every generation of the instrument builds on the knowledge of. Uh, the whole population of engineers and safety people and related people that are working on this. So it gets better. And humans evolve on the scale of the evolution. So humans, even if they are amazing in many ways, but it's inevitable that they end up as the weakest link, right? If you think about it. And, and I think overselling it and, and saying that that is the case now 
would be doing a disservice to uh, to, to to the industry. Uh, but it is inevitable that uh, you know we were not built to control things that fly at 150 knots, you know, at, at six uh, thousand feet or or lower is actually harder. And so that you can build on machines, and that you can these machines get better and better, and then you know you um, the the human the crew can retreat to a position of monitoring that everything's safe on time scales that humans are comfortable with. Uh, I think is uh, an inevitable trend of, of engineering. Amanda has an interesting question. Um, we've talked about the sensors a little bit already, or quite a bit of it uh, already. Um, and we've talked about the weather degradation where it might be a oh. gradual effect. She's asking something about that is much more sudden, um, brownouts. How, how would it handle a situation like a brownout yeah. where all of a sudden so, you're landing and then you have zero visibility? Right. Uh, then, you no, know, our cameras are um, with the technical term SOL. Uh, but because, uh, you know, we can't see just in the visual. Uh, um, so uh, and what we can help with maybe is not get there maybe we can recognize possible brownouts on approach before it's too late um so you know it, it just adding a bunch of cameras and some magic ai source is not gonna make you know it, it's not gonna change a lot of physics um and uh, brownouts typically you know your long wave infrared is not gonna help you uh, either uh what we can what we can recognize is that you know that looks like this looks like a patch of snow where I'm going to have a massive whiteout. How about I don't go land there? And um, or there's a twirling tarp, you know, that would be would be a tail rotor hazard. You know, these are things we can help with. We cannot make it. You know, we can't. You know, switch off gravity and danger um, with with just just a pair of cameras. Richard asks. Um, well, actually, let's start with a question from Neil. What developments in sensor technologies do you anticipate in the next decade? Huh. Uh, I expect that uh, somebody the lidars will keep getting getting cheaper. That's driven by the automotive industry, and then it will be possible to have solid state uh, lidars with good resolution and good range that are usable for our use case. So your typical automotive uh, lidar has uh, uh, too short a range, or you know you, you have to pump up the power. Which is not nice for you know, all the people flying around. Um, so the, I think lidars will become cheaper, and that's another way where you can add extra sensors, you know, extra redundancy, a certain amount of uh, IMC uh, tolerance. Um, we use visual spectrum cameras. We're we're pretty happy with uh, how they are. It's the resolutions that are there are high enough. Um, we're more bound by the lenses, and we're bound by computing capacity. And ironically, the hardest thing in the past seven years is getting compute equipment that's powerful enough and certifiable uh, to do the kind of uh, power lifting that we need on our. So it's not so much the um, the sensors, it's the compute power. And there, it's there. You know, in a data center, you have unlimited power. But putting it in a box, so your typical uh, helicopter builder uh, would like this thing to weigh absolutely nothing and consume no power whatsoever. So if we show up with our four, four kilogram box and uh, 150 watts for the first generation, they were like, "Yeah." And we said, oh, "Don't worry, it's the first generation experimental thing." But you know, you can you can do that thing in an airliner, but not in a helicopter. So that's actually the I and I expect that we will make um, some progress there. And then there's an interesting constraint in the aerospace uh, in the avionics world that the volumes are so small that for most manufacturers it's not an interesting field and they you know they're not exactly dying to give us the level of documentation to get our uh, our system certified so we're 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 finding this battle with one hand tied behind our back and we end up having to take on more and more of the system design ourselves because otherwise we can't get certification documentation together that was a surprise compared to seven and a half years ago well, that actually brings up a question from uh, Jim, um, and you just answered, I believe, a good portion of it. Are there any other hurdles um, that AI is facing right. for certification in aviation? Well, so I think we've made super good progress with the uh, AIs and the FAA. Uh, we found, uh, contrary to what everybody said, oh, oh, the FAA will never do this, and they will always do that. We found a very willing ear. If you come with, you know, if you if you show that you've done your homework. 
and uh, that you take their concerns seriously and you try to learn to speak their language. Because that's so that was actually I, I, I alluded to that in my introductory talk. I tried to bridge these two cultures. You know, people that make apps for phones should not be allowed, you know, within typing distance from a keyboard uh, when it comes to programming safety critical software. Um, but people that come from, uh, from from academia and robotics have no idea what the concerns are, you know, for, for, for safety. At the same time, words like random, you know, mean something very specific for mathematicians, mean something completely different from for aerospace safety engineers. And so to learn to speak these 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 languages and get and address these concerns um, is, uh, you know, it's, it's humans talking to humans, building a story for humans that this thing is safe. Uh, you know uh, that that's that that's grounded in in firm reality. Uh, I completely lost my train of thought. What what was the question again? <laughs> well, uh, so you... we found a very we found a very willing ear with the regulators to certify the AI when we came up with a plan. The hurdle has been this compute equipment, where to use these fantastic GPU chips that people have, they're just not going to give me the documentation because. You know they're going to sell ten thousand units at best. You know, and, and these are they would kill any product line that sells less than hundred million. And then uh, the reputation risk of being involved in an airplane uh, or a helicopter crash, you know, is is, is probably not worth it for most uh, uh, big ticket. Um, uh, so so getting the sort of we we did not anticipate that we'd had to had to design our own PCBs. And, and write our own FPGA codes. Okay, okay, well, you when you talk about the certification and the human factor, that let's slide over to the the human interaction side of this. Um, yeah, I'll, we have a question from Alden. It's a little bit long. It's a little bit complex, but um, okay. He, Alden is asking, Reliable Robotics. Robert Rose recently made the following statement on a podcast. Quote. I'm not comfortable with a system where people say, well, because it worked for several thousand hours, because we did so many right. lines, it's safe. That's just bogus. That's not the way these certification processes work. Right. Uh, training a neural net with lots of data and then testing it against lots of data, which seems to be what Mr. Rose is talking about. How do you feel about that statement as it relates to your planned certification right. map? Right. So that, that's a very good point. I know uh, Mr. Rose well, because he was actually my boss, basically. And um, so we, we've talked about this a lot. So actually, uh, for Dahl B, uh, bringing us 10,000 hours of service history is a valid argument. But you know, Dahl D is suitable for the minor things where you, you don't care if you switch it off. Uh, our neural network training and verification is not like that. We don't build the whole thing, then fly it for 10,000 hours and say, look, we saw this many aircraft, therefore it's good. Uh, the argument has to be much stronger. Uh, you have to actually show uh, with, you know, with considerable amount of evidence that you would see. So a typical requirement for such a system as uh, the, the traffic detection looks like uh, with probability 95%, we establish a track uh, within two seconds of the aircraft entering the detection range. And for those that we don't, you know, within four seconds, you know, this, this many percentage. And that that, that, that that percentage is 95% is in itself not, you know, that that shouldn't you shouldn't let you write it off for radars. You know uh, you have a finite probability of detecting something. So and these you can make the radar to doll A, and the radar still has a chance of not seeing things. So how do you argue um, to a doll A uh, level of uh, so ten to the minus you know seven or nine uh, that your uh, visual traffic detection system is good enough. It's not by just flying it around for 10,000 hours. You have to carefully architect your system so that you can build this argument. I was alluding to something similar earlier. You, know, you can make a cool demo if you use the motion, but then you can't use the fact that you saw it when it moved as evidence that you would see it if it didn't move. Um, so here, in this case, the neural network itself has two important numbers, the precision and the recall. Um, on a data set. So given one image with an aircraft in it, how often do I miss that aircraft? That's a false negative. And how often, if there's an, no aircraft, do I say that this one? So in these numbers, you know, if you make a very good network and you have a very good training set, you can, you can make a big enough set to say that this probability is 83%, you know, precise and 86% and uh, recall. And these numbers are within these bounds. And then you have this one component. 
then to glue that argument to your system, you have to design your system in such a way that these probabilities multiply and add up in the right way. So you have to design your system so that this works. And in the case, I can I can give you a taste of how this works. Um, if you if you if you look out the window, you blink and you don't look again, and then you try to memorize, you know, what did I see in aircraft and use that to to, to avoid what you saw. Other example, if you look out the window, see the runway, then close your eyes and fly to what you think you saw, you know, you would not have a very high chance of successfully landing your aircraft. When you approach, you know, you have every frame that the camera takes, you have a new chance of getting it right and getting it wrong. And from one frame to the next, these error probabilities are correlated, but after a while, it's a new, you know, fresh roll of the dice. And if you roll the dice, you know, often enough, then uh, statistics and the central limit theorem uh, are with you in, uh, if you design your system correctly, that the probability of getting it always wrong consistently you know, drops off far enough. But, and then you can put something on top of that that says, and the probability that I don't notice that I'm not actually seeing the runway you know, goes to epsilon. So you don't do this by you know, flying 10,000 hours. You do this by very carefully. So we have a motto in the company that says it helps if you know what you're doing. So this is an example of to build up this knowledge and build up a team that can come up with such arguments. It's actually a fairly alien form of thinking to most aspects of uh, aerospace engineering. So this is this is data science. This is um, the, the kind of math that you find you know, in certain pockets in university, not directly associated with making avionics. And so when I created the company, I thought exactly you know, there's value in bringing together people that can build up such arguments to to build this um, uh, type of certification evidence. So to summarize, your criticism is 100% correct, and that's why we don't do that. Okay, I know. <laughs> I hope I answered the question. Yeah, I know it's very late where you are <laughs> getting uh, towards the top of the hour. Uh, we're not going to be able to get to all the questions. Let me uh, finish by asking. To take that a little bit further, certification seems like it's going to be not an issue. We're, I'm part of a generation that grew up with movies that showed uh, flying cars, um, the, yeah. the goods and bads of artificial intelligence. How do you achieve human acceptance of a passenger ah. flight powered by artificial intelligence? Right. Uh, what, 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 what's your process there? So uh, uh, I don't have, you know, the complete answer ready, but I have an analogy that has been used by others that, you know, 100 years ago, uh, if you went into an elevator, there was, you know, a guy in a little, you know, costume who would push the buttons for you. And uh, elevators at that time were dangerous. And then, you know, regulations were introduced and elevators became a lot safer and it became acceptable to push these buttons yourself. And nowadays, if you go to an elevator, and there's someone there to push the buttons for you, like, what's wrong with this elevator? Um, if you look at, uh, I, I, in one of my uh, presentation decks, I have a photo of the cockpit of uh, an early Boeing in the 1950s. There's a lot of people in there. There's navigators, radio operator, there's, you know, a uh, mechanic. And nowadays, if you walk into a cockpit and you see that many people, you'd go like, what's wrong with this aircraft? <laughs> you know, why does it need so many people on board? And so um, I think uh, that uh, by this is one of our strategies by rolling it out as, you know, through the OPV, we give you know safety addition first. You know we're going to move to the there's an intermediate phase where the crew interacts with the flight plan. Then we introduce uh, command and controlling to the ground. You interact with the flight plan you know from the ground crew because there's nothing on board that you could do. You know, take a rocket. Uh, where uh, Mr. Rose and I uh, work on. You know, if something's wrong with that rocket, um, not a lot you can do from the ground. You know, the computer basically has to handle it for you. And um, so we come through this phase where the interactions uh, are at the strategic level in the flight plan, not so much at the tactical level. Uh, and that means that when the, the command and control link drops, you know, we're not in a state of panic, but the computer is going to look at its watch and say, okay, I haven't heard from the ground for 30 seconds. If I don't hear from the ground for another 30 seconds, I'm going to find a land as soon as practical site. Or, you know, given the risk of my mission, I'm going to land as soon as possible uh, to, to name two extremes. And we can, uh, and so once we have this phase, 
um, you know, I think people will see. Uh, you have to. You have to also remember that for for every heroic case where two people saved the day, you know, there were people that flew into uh, IMC uh, or didn't see this cable or, or didn't save the day. And so, if you gather the evidence, and that's where I think the ten thousand hours it does become a valid argument uh, for the public acceptance. If you know, it becomes exceedingly rare that something happens with something that currently has a lot of, shall we say, headroom for safety, uh, such as commercial helicopter operations, then then this acceptance uh, will come. Dr. Van Dyke, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Um, I, I think we could have easily gone for several hours on this topic. Um, I, I suspect yeah, I'd like we to even try to have you back uh, <laughs> again in the future for updates. But uh, no, this I was fascinating, and I, I really enjoyed the uh, the presentation today. Thank you. Uh, I'll be happy to make it available. And uh, thank you for having me. And I welcome further questions. Okay, well, I'm going to uh, go ahead and wrap things up today. Um, and just finish with a few housekeeping items. Um, as we always finish up with our webinars, we do appreciate whoops. Get to the right slide there. There we go. We are now on the second Thursday of every month for our webinars. Uh, we have an update um, with Boeing. Actually, looks like I got the title in the wrong spot. Um, Boeing update. Uh, we'll be discussing improving operational efficiencies throughout the helicopter life cycle. Um, that will be the February 11th topic, the March 7th topic, which should I, which I accidentally replaced with the, the Boeing topic, is uh, going to be a state of the industry address with uh, Jim Viola. That will be, actually be a live event. There's going to be some uh, special news that will be coming up at HAI Heli Expo. Um, there is a, que a question mark there by the date of March 7th. The, the problem with that is um, that's the week after Heli Expo. We're making sure that everybody's going to be available to uh, attend the presentation that week. Uh, but um, it's going to be something that a, a lot, especially the HAI members are going to want to attend and uh, the industry, I believe, as a whole will uh, find interesting. We're also looking at uh, accident investigation webinar and preventing auto rotation mishaps. Um, and the one I didn't have on there is hydrogen powered aircraft. So we're trying to get into some of the new technology coming up. Uh, we at HAI love to communicate. We love to share news. We have a couple different publications that uh, are a couple different products that will help you. Uh, Rotor Magazine is an award-winning quarterly publication. This is our 75th anniversary edition. It's uh, going to be going to press. We thought it was going to be already at press. We delayed it because there's some things that we just didn't get quite right. We want to make sure it's perfect for the, uh, the 75th anniversary. Um, it's going to be spectacular. It's going to be a much thicker edition than uh, normal, and it's going to be um, something you're going to want to uh, look through from time to time. Um, Rotor Daily is a business daily news aggregate source. We do the Google searches. We do the searches through EASA, the FAA, to find the news that's relevant to you, to our industry, so that you don't have to. We are happy to send that to your uh, email box uh, every business day. Uh, easiest way to subscribe to both of those is go to rotor.org slash subscribe. There's no cost for the magazine or Rotor Daily unless you live outside the United States and then there might be a small stipend for uh, shipping the magazine. That would be the only thing. We uh, may be sending a questionnaire to you shortly. If you do receive one, we ask that you take just a few minutes to let us know what you thought of today's webinar. Um, if you want to see uh, Dr. Van Dyke back, uh, please let us know that as well. HAI is a membership organization. Um, it's very important that we're providing the services that our industry needs and wants. If you have some ideas, some uh, concepts of what we could do or we should stop doing, please let us know that as well. Best way to do that is uh, through an email to our president and CEO, James Viola, president at rotor.org. He sees them all. He uh, passes them out. He responds to all of them. Um, and we will get your answer for you. That does conclude our webinar for today. We appreciate that you took the time out of your schedule to watch, and we hope that you'll join us again very, very soon. Until then, we hope that you be safe and fly safe.